Love is in the air. Wait. Burnt electrolytic capacitors from around the year 2000. And Threadripper 5000. This is a WRX80 motherboard. You probably knew that from clicking the title. This is the MC62G40. Again, information that you already had. Threadripper 5000 is launching. It uses the same chipset as Threadripper Pro 3000. That's WRX80. WRX80 is uh, neat. And Threadripper Pro 5000 is neat. Let's see what Gigabyte is cooking up with this motherboard. Threadripper Pro 5000, how we got here is kind of an interesting story. Threadripper Pro originally launched with Lenovo. Lenovo had exclusive access to Threadripper Pro. Threadripper Pro was closer to Epic Server than a really desktop. I think this was, you know, conjecture, just my random opinion here, but I think this was a little bit of an experiment for AMD to see what, if any, the extent would be that Threadripper Pro might erode uh, some of the market for Epic. I mean, AMD could sell Epic class CPUs in the workstation market, and certainly with what we've seen in terms of, you know, pricing and the global situation over the last couple of years, uh, what you used to consider to be a really expensive server CPU maybe isn't so expensive anymore, or considering the fact that the AMD Epic CPUs are extremely price competitive with pre-existing CPUs that were also ludicrously expensive in the market. I mean, AMD's holding its own, and they're not the value proposition anymore. They're just what you get if you need raw horsepower performance. So Threadripper Pro 5000 kind of was the same. Lenovo got first crack at it, but it seems like things are coming a little sooner, maybe, in terms of availability in OEMs. I noticed Puget Systems, they have Threadripper Pro systems that are fully available. Gigabyte, the server division, launched their version of a WRX80 motherboard for Threadripper Pro. But because of this workstation server overlap, this SWORK station, if you will, which we've done a lot of videos on, uh, different divisions in different companies are building motherboards based on WRX80 that are more server-like or more workstation-like. This board is more server-like. So let's dive in. So in the box, you get basically a standard size, little, it's a little bit wider, not a lot. It's a little bit wider. A standard size ATX motherboard, but that has more standard fare IO. It's got onboard VGA because yes, it does have onboard uh, remote management and A-Speed 2600. We have seven X16 expansion slots. Our chipset with the chipset fan, this is a standard chipset fan, so if something ever happens to this fan, you can just order another one from eBay or AliExpress or anything. The VRM configuration on this motherboard is a 3 plus 8 configuration, and it looks like we've also got three phases for our DIMMs, so running a high density memory configuration on this board, two terabytes, should be no problem based on the voltage delivery. However, this motherboard will require uh, pretty good amounts of airflow. The heatsink fins are oriented the correct way. We don't have any extra cooling on our chokes. So a good front to back airflow situation if you plan to use this board in a desktop configuration would be my recommendation. Probably the Fractal Torrent is gonna be a winning solution here because standard-ish, pretty much ATX seven slots and the cooling of the torrent with the VRM right in front here, it's gonna be your best bet. We have two onboard 80 millimeter M.2 at the front bottom edge of the motherboard. There's also an E-key M.2 at the top edge here if you're gonna run a Wi-Fi connection or if you're a crazy person and you want an extra two and a half gig NIC, as we saw in some other level one videos, you can put that in there and that'll run just fine. An extra Intel two and a half gig NIC in our E-key M.2, what? It would be nice to have more USB at the rear. We have five type A, two 10 gigabit, one type C, one type A, and then of course, four five gigabit, as well as onboard dual one gig. For power, this motherboard has dual eight pin CPU power inputs, as well as the standard 24 pin. There is not a header for more auxiliary power input, which worries me if you're gonna use this board with a heavy GPU configuration. I'm gonna go ahead and say that if you're gonna use this for a heavy GPU configuration, that that's probably not enough 12 volt power input because each heavy GPU is gonna use 75 watts through the slot. So if you're planning on you know water cooling a bunch of A100s and using all seven slots, um, would not recommend that. The slot second from the end of the motherboard, 
This one is also only PCI Express by eight electrical, even though it is PCI Express by 16 physical. Now I think Gigabyte should be committed because this is just plain old cardboard, compostable, no special inks or anything like that. You can just put it right in your compost pile and you're good to go. Now for testing, I've got our Threader Pro, Pro 3000 CPU. Don't have any 5000 CPUs yet. Working on it, working on it. And our Arctic TR4 SP3 cooler. Now in terms of other connectors on the motherboard, the three connectors at the front for SlimSass are rated for PCI Express by four but I don't have any cables good enough to test that. I got PCI Express by three to work, that wasn't an issue. We've also got two 30 pin front panel connections, one of which is at a right angle, but almost all of the fan connections are along the bottom edge of the motherboard. So if you intended to use a double wide card at the bottom with an extra tall case, like the, the fractal cases that are eight slots at the back instead of seven, it would be a little problematic. One thing that Gigabyte does that I really, really like is they actually add an analog a temperature sensor that comes into direct contact with your M.2. That's what this little sensor is on the foam under your M.2. So if you're rocking a really high-end M.2 like the Samsung 983, those will get a little toasty. And if you're going to use them with this board, they need a heat sink or they need crazy server levels of airflow. That sensor is going to be able to monitor that and you can actually use the onboard management to tie those sensors into fan RPM. This is a really nice fail safe that uh, <laughs> relies on the board actually checking the temperatures of the M.2. It's a, it's a really good creature comfort feature that Gigabyte has been doing on their boards for several generations now, and I love it. It's great. If you are gonna use this board with uh, multiple machine learning accelerators, then I would recommend that you also disable the onboard VGA, which is part of the IPMI. You don't have to disable the IPMI completely, you just disable the VGA adapter because it can confuse your host operating system, especially if your host operating system is Windows. Once we're in the BIOS, there's a little bit more about the system that we can see and see what features it offers and that kind of thing. First off, the BIOS, it's more of a server-ish BIOS than a workstation BIOS. That said, there are some rudimentary controls for being able to control the overall fan speed of the platform, but if you want more finer grain control, you're gonna have to dive into the uh, IPMI, the remote management over the network. Speaking of which, the four connections on the back, that's an X550 Intel 10 gigabit, so that'll link at one, two and a half, five, or 10 gigabit. And then there's also a single I210, one gigabit. The other interface is a dedicated interface for the IPMI. We've seen some boards issue the dedicated IPMI in, in lieu of a cost saving shared option, but this board does have a dedicated IPMI. If you're planning on using Threader for Pro as kind of a server-ish sort of role, um, and you need the out of band management or a separate physical connection for your remote management, you can do that with this board. I was able to configure CTTP with this board, but there's no options for PBO or any kind of Threadripper Pro overclocking, which AMD has promised in this generation. Not too surprising, like I say, even though, you know, there are multiple kinds of WRX80 motherboards available or multiple vendors, there are, you know, sort of enthusiast WRX80 motherboards, and then there are, let's get some work done RX, WRX80 motherboards, and that's what this is. This is a get work done motherboard. That kind of makes sense if you look at the VRM configuration. I mean, the 3 plus 8 is going to deliver the 280 watts at the absolute maximum top end, but you're not going to have any margin beyond that. And you'll still need adequate cooling for that as it is. One thing's for sure, you can always count on Gigabyte to get the little details correct. For our PCIe slot configuration, yes, you can configure by 4, by 8, or by 16. Even by 4, by 4, by 8. So no matter what kind of PCIe slot configuration you need to run, you know, with whatever breakout cables or whatever kind of mad science you're doing, Gigabyte is going to support that in the BIOS. Right now, today, nothing special needed. In terms of SATA device support, our Norco 4224 has 24 drives. We could actually use 16 of these immediately with nothing special required, no add-in cards or anything, just with what this motherboard supports out of the box. 16 SATA device connections. That's pretty nice. I imagine we'll see these boards used in uh, hybrid solutions like software development servers where you need NVMe caching along with the bulk storage of spinning rust because this platform can do it all. It's pretty nice. Good job, Gigabyte. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look at a new WRX80 motherboard from Gigabyte, coinciding with the launch of Threadripper 5000 for the enthusiast DIY and system integrator market. If you have any questions or you want to see a build with this or anything like that, come to the Level 1 forum. Oh, and there's a link in the description below. Uh, you can check that out at Gigabyte's website. If you do, that would help me out a lot. All right, thanks, and I'll see you in the forums.